Okay, so let's start. Uh, good actually afternoon and or evening for some people. Uh, my name is Cornel Mucci. I'm the manager of transportation planning at the region of Waterloo. And I would like to welcome all of you to this web-based workshop. Uh, it's excellent to see so many people. I think we have 30 some uh, uh, or, or people uh, on, on the call and a few more are coming. And uh, thanks for staff from Cambridge, Kitchener, Waterloo for participating. I mean, you are our partners in, in making the entire region more cycling friendly. And it was about, I think, eight years ago in 2012 uh, when I organized a similar webinar. Actually, it was not webinar, sorry. It was a real meeting, a real workshop uh, where we shook hands with each other in, in Ottawa. And uh, that was kind of the uh, beginning of the change for the way how we thought of uh, designing cycling facilities. There were lots of discussions following that uh, initial meeting and uh, eventually the the whole concept of uh, thinking about intersections started to shift so when rc uh, the bicycle mayor of waterloo uh, approached me around two months ago and uh, suggested that maybe we should uh, bring uh, some experts from the netherlands to the dutch cycling embassy uh, for a presentation here in the region, I immediately uh, knew what the answer is going to be to that. So here we are today. Uh, this workshop is supported by the Consulate of the Netherlands in Toronto, and we do appreciate their financial contribution. And now I would like to invite Jorn Lixma, the Netherlands Deputy Consul General, to say a few words. Thank you, Cornel. Good afternoon, everybody, and good evening to the participants in the Netherlands. Uh, my name is Jorn Leekstra, and I'm the Deputy Head of Mission at the Consulate uh, in Toronto. Together with our colleagues in Ottawa and Vancouver, our team in Toronto has the great mission to improve the trade between the Netherlands and Canada by sharing best practices and building partnerships between our two countries. Therefore, we are very pleased to co-host today's discussion on sustainable cycling infrastructure in the Waterloo region. With our partners, the Bike Mayor of Waterloo, the region of Waterloo, the Dutch Cycling Embassy, Mobicon, and the city of Utrecht. I myself will not go into the topic of cycling as we will later listen to the experts, but I will tell you something about the role of the consulate. Our responsibilities can basically be divided into three pillars. Consular services, being the issuance of visas and passports, public diplomacy, the creation of a positive image of the Netherlands in Canada, and last but not least, economic diplomacy, which we consider the promotion of bilateral trade and investments. We do this in a proactive way on the following focus themes, water, agro-food, circular economy, and innovation. A somewhat more overarching theme is smart and resilient cities, where mobility and healthy living are cross-cutting themes. And I always consider the consulate to be a broker. We are here to open doors for Dutch businesses and knowledge institutes, to disseminate information, to promote Dutch expertise, and to connect Canadian and Dutch parties. And I feel therefore confident that we will utilize initiatives like the, this webinar to further broaden the relationship between our two countries. And that leaves me with thanking the presenters of today for their contributions and wishing you all an inspiring session. Thank you and back to you, Cornel. Thanks, Jorn. Uh, and now let me introduce Chris Bruntlett from the Dutch Cycling Embassy. Chris was born in the UK, he grew up in Kitchener, moved to Vancouver, and then he went for vacation to the Netherlands in 2016. And as he says, he fell in love with its seemingly effortless bicycle culture. So I don't know what does it mean, how can you fall into love with that, but I mean he did. So he's there and he is uh, with the Dutch Cycling Embassy and promoting cycling globally. Chris? Thanks, Cornell, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today from Delft in the Netherlands, as, as Cornell indicated. Uh, we at the Dutch Cycling Embassy do uh, a lot of these webinars around the world, uh, North and South America, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Asia, and Europe. But this one hits really close ho uh, to home for me, having grown up uh, in Kitchener 
I went to Resurrection High School, met my wife there, and uh, uh, my parents uh, and her parents still live there. So uh, we uh, hopefully will have an influence on, on creating safe spaces for them to cycle uh, in, in our former hometown. We've got a really excellent uh, lineup for you today. As you can see, uh, Herbert Tiemens from the City of Utrecht and Leonard Now from Mobicon will be giving presentations. Uh, we'll have time for a short coffee break and then uh, about 45 minutes of question and answer, um, which I would invite you to uh, submit your questions using the chat function uh, and we will uh, disseminate them and, and process them and, and go through them one by one. I uh, also wanted to note that today's session is being recorded. We will post a private YouTube link of the video uh, for attendees to review and those that couldn't join us today but still registered, uh, as well as PDF versions of all the slideshows for your reference. Um, so before we get started, just a little bit, uh, a few words about the Dutch Cycling Embassy. We're a public-private partnership based in Utrecht in the Netherlands, uh, between the national government here in the Netherlands and about 75 organizations that work in the field of cycling. So they are private consultants, academic institutions, uh, municipal governments, technology companies, bicycle manufacturers. If they're working in the field of cycling and looking to ex uh, export uh, their products and services internationally, we generally work with them and, and help them uh, to, to do so. Uh, as I say, we have a really broad cross-section of, of um, knowledge and expertise that exists here, of all different types of organizations. Um, and, and we pride ourselves on being able to handle uh, all kinds of requests from all different types of partners and, and acting as a facilitator between uh, all those experts and the demand for Dutch expertise. Uh, Pre-COVID, it, it looked very differently. Uh, our work was twofold in that we were hosting study tours and international delegations. Uh, we bring teams of decision makers and engineers and, and politicians to Dutch cities, uh, ideally Dutch cities that are comparable to their own context, allow them to cycle the streets and then sit them down in a, a kind of a classroom setting and allow them to understand how those conditions came about and, and what's so important about them. Um, and inversely, we also would take teams of Dutch experts to these uh, uh, local and regional governments and conduct workshops and, and, and help them with their specific challenges. As you can imagine, post COVID things have changed significantly. The demand for cycling expertise has grown, uh, but uh, our ability to travel has, has not. And so we've done a, a lot of these types of webinars and digital workshops uh, with an eye on hopefully resuming uh, physical travel and face-to-face -face contact in the new year. So for now, I'm going to uh, just hand the floor to Herbert. Um, and, and when I do so, uh, so let me make him the host of this meeting so he can share the slides. I cannot share my screen with you. I've just stopped sharing, sorry. And you stopped you, sharing, yep. You are now the host, so you can go ahead and... Uh, Try again. This one. There we are. Well, welcome. Thank you for having the floor. It's an honor for me to uh, talk uh, about in Canada about uh, cycling in the Netherlands as we were once liberated uh, partly by Canadians. We have now movie uh, The Ballad the Schelde and it's a part of history. It's, uh, that's not very much known. It was very important for us. I won't go into the details. You have to watch the movie on Netflix or where, whichever channel is available. I will talk uh, today a bit about uh, bike and transit in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, later on, uh, Leonard, he will talk a bit more about uh, um, the, the cycling in the cities itself, how it works in the Netherlands. But I will give an overview of what we are doing and, uh, at our train stations, especially. Um, because we know we have to cut down our CO2 emissions and part of the solution is uh, making our transport more energy efficient. And if you look into the details, well, this is in Dutch, but um, over here you can see what trains are doing and what walking and cycling doing. 
if you combine those two, then per kilometer, you have the best uh, solution for uh, longer distances that you then that you can walk or cycle um, for your uh, moving around. Well, um, bikes and trains. Um, we have two two ways uh, uh, to see that you can uh, cycle to the train station, park your bike, hop on the train, and then do your last part after the train station to your destination. Um, the other one is uh, uh, take your bike into the train and or in the in the vehicle, and then um, uh, uh, go your, to your destination on your own bike or on a share bike, whatever. On the left, you see a picture uh, how it's done in Germany. Very nice with a Dutch bike. Um, uh, on the right, you can see how we are handling it in the Netherlands. We have a compartment where you pop in your bike, and that, that's it. Well. This is not a scalable uh, solution. And uh, with the density that we have in the Netherlands, um, we say, okay, it's good uh, if you want to take your bike for leisure, for a, a holiday or for a long uh, or a, a trip that you make maybe once a year. Um, but this is not scalable for everyday use. We don't want to encourage people uh, for commuting to take their bike into the train. Um, folding bikes are expelled of it because you can uh, 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 fold them and then takes less space. So we don't talk about this one at this moment. We talk about the simple solution, park your bike at the train station and then uh, hop on the train. Well, this is in the province of Utrecht, the uh, uh, train station of Soest. And it's the most simple solution that we have in uh, the Netherlands. It's uh, 16 racks where you can park your bike. There's even space available. You pick a newspaper and then you hop on the platform. You're on the platform. Very good solution. Um, but as soon as uh, things go get bigger, then uh, we have to uh, investigate a bit more how it's looking. Well. I have been in Canada before and I also saw a train station and I was really pleased with that there uh, was something similar like in Soest. This is the train station, central station of uh, Winnipeg. Um, there's, uh, well, 10 trains a week. So that's not that ma many uh, trains that are running. If you compare that to the train station of Soest, um, and, well, they have every half an hour a train in two directions. So that's even more. Well, train stations in Netherlands, they are pretty dense. And for us, uh, then it becomes an issue how to travel to the train station. If you have a lot of uh, uh, options to, to travel to, then uh, uh, cycling to uh, the train station, as you can see on the, on the picture on the part left, and the train station two might be a, a 10 minute ride with a bit difficult route, but it takes you directly to the train, to your destination or almost directly. And that might be different than only a five minute uh, uh, bike ride uh, where it's free to park your bike, then have three minutes train ride and then 45 minutes of uh, another train and then uh, walk to your train destination. That's different. So we have a lot of information in the Netherlands nowadays, how people are uh, effectively using both bikes and train. Uh, uh, we made models of it, uh, uh, the University of Delft. They have a really nice uh, modeling that takes all these factors into account. Um, you can see it in the, in the graph, the distance that people want to travel to the train station and uh, want to uh, uh, use a different mode of transport. So obviously when it's close by people walk, when it's uh, two or three kilometers people cycle and it tend to be longer than people might take a bus or a tram or other transit. Um, and also, well, cars, they also take a uh, uh, share, but not that much. It's, it's mostly cars as a passenger, and then uh, drivers themselves who go to a train station and then hop in the train. 
if you know that the majority of people lives in the Netherlands within five kilometers of the of a train station, 80% of the Dutch they live within five kilometers, then you know uh, uh, walking and cycling they are taking huge share of uh, 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 going and also uh, leaving from the train station. So this for us is uh, a part of science. It's really good because um, it, it shows also uh, 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 where we have to invest in it. Um, cycling makes uh, the catchment area a bit bigger. Well, quite a lot bigger. Uh, if you walk, well, maybe one kilometer uh, uh, can be done. Uh, but if you cycle, five kilometers is easy doable. We found this with uh, tracking data that uh, the, 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 catch, the, the catchment area is, uh, is longer, it's bigger. And uh, we have this information also to find out on which side of the railway uh, uh, you have to build your uh, parking for the trains. Really helpful for us because it's large investments that we have. Um, the picture on the right, you can see the city of Den Bosch. Well, it's, the, uh, it's a city, 90,000 people. Uh, it has three stations uh, close by, but uh, the main one uh, uh, in the red dot, it's uh, Dempel's, uh, the central station, so to say, but it has direct connections to uh, uh, Eindhoven in the south and um, Utrecht, Amsterdam in the north. Uh, trains are running uh, six times an hour. So for them, it's really uh, convenient to cycle a bit longer to hop on the direct train. Um, and uh, for us, um, well, it works really good uh, in everyday life. It, this is the way we commute. So now going to Utrecht, um, where I'm working, and it's in the heart of the Netherlands. It's really the, the node, the central node of the network. Um, this is the network of the trains uh, that we have in the Netherlands for reference. Um, it's the size of Nova Scotia, but it has uh, the population is uh, almost uh, the same as Canada, I, I believe. Well, I, I shouldn't be. Chris knows the numbers better about Canada, but uh, uh, 17 million people are living on a tiny bit of land. Uh, Utrecht is uh, somewhere over there, and uh, within two hours you can travel almost to all parts of this network at least the blue lines, those are the, the main uh, uh, operator, Dutch railways, and then we have some regional uh, railways. Uh, the tracks are all owned by a rail track company, um, and that's part of the government. Uh, it's, it's now placed a part of uh, national government, but still it, it's, well, having its uh, subsidies uh, from uh, the state and also get its uh, uh, money from uh, giving rights to operators to uh, uh, run trains over it. So, well, it looks like this on a rainy day. Uh, of course, uh, even when it rains, uh, the old canal is a beautiful place to go, but also uh, uh, next to it, we have the train station. And the train station in the past, it looked something like uh, an ocean of bicycles. As you can travel within two hours to every corner of the country, people tend to live in Utrecht and have flexible jobs to, to go everywhere. And people really make uh, 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 an easy uh, way of living. They cycle to this train station and then hop on the train. Um, and we saw the numbers growing. Um, we had about uh, 10, 12, 15,000 bicycles outside around the, the the train station on different locations so 10 years ago uh, we said well we want to densify the, the 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 area around it especially for people that are uh, 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 traveling to utrecht to work and we want to uh, densify it and we want to make it safer for people that can park their bike at train stations we decided uh, together with the national operator with the state with, the, uh, with every, every party together, we said, well, let's, let's do something new. Let's build garages to build, uh, uh, to park bicycles. 
so we started uh, we had already a uh, smaller garages 5000 and uh, uh, 1500 bicycles that could be stored and we were uh, working on, on uh, different locations that we could easily uh, park uh, well in the end 22000 bicycles um, and that's uh, uh, really a lot. As you can see on this picture, I took it a few years ago from our office. Um, you can see in the middle uh, the sea of bicycles everywhere, and it's taking a huge space. And if you compare that, people were walking a longer time uh, uh, from their parked bicycle to the train station to the platform than actually cycling in the city itself from their home then we knew that we had to do something, that uh, this wasn't a, a system that couldn't work anymore. So uh, you can see the cranes where we were building the garage. And uh, well, this is the smaller garage, 4,500 bicycles can be parked here. And uh, uh, it's uh, in three stories and both, all, all three stories have uh, double tier racks. So double uh, bicycles are put on top of each other. And uh, by this, uh, we can increase the capacity dramatically. It's really uh, uh, a lot of steel, but um, because of the colors uh, it and, and, and the way it functions, uh, people feel very confident and very safe about it. There's also uh, staff walking around and also at the, at the entrance that uh, checks uh, if uh, you are leaving with your own bicycle. Um, the recent uh, open bicycle garage, well, it was opened last year, but for me it's still recent because I haven't been there for half a year now, is uh, underneath uh, the new platform. I will show a short video. I don't know if it will work properly by Zoom, but I will send you the link because it's also on YouTube. Yeah. So. So we're entering here by bike. You can check in on the right, but also you can follow this corridor and you have 17 corridors to park your bike. And it's an insane machine, uh, very efficient uh, with the red carpet for cycling. And uh, well, where's uh, blank uh, concrete there, you have to uh, walk, there's a pump, to pump, to pump your tires as a small bike shop for your daily repairs. And the amazing thing is you can cycle out again. So there's a, a, a running cycle track into the, this uh, garage itself. And you are outdoors again. This was all uh, before COVID. Uh, I think it's maybe one year ago I took this video. Um, we were still working on the, on the outskirts and well, we haven't finished yet. Still a building site here. Well, these huge garages, they, they give us a problem because people cannot find a place where to park a bike. They cannot find, re, re, they find their bike back and uh, that gives us, uh, uh, well, a new challenge, where to park your bike and also how to find it. Um, for this, uh, we installed in every rack uh, a sensor. We have sensors on the, uh, on the roof and they can observe if there's a, a free space. So we have different systems, uh, optical sensors, but also we have sensors in the racks itself. And by that, uh, we can show how many bikes are per corridor available. Of course, if you have this system, you can also put it online. You can uh, make an app of it. And also we have signs in the streets where people can see uh, before they are at the train station, which garage to use. Right. So this is the... the, the, the the totem that uh, we are using nowadays, the, the third incarnation. Um, and well, at this moment with COVID-19, uh, we have half of it uh, empty. 
but uh, uh, well, uh, uh, we hope that it will return to normal again. Well, we learned a lot about uh, this train station because uh, uh, it's 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 huge, and uh, we are now putting all these uh, knowledge into books and also in, in new programs, because we see that uh, we are growing the number of uh, uh, people that want to take the train. And uh, also the train stations, they are expanding. So this is an example how we are studying the train station of Leiden, uh, another big train station in the Netherlands. And uh, in orange, uh, that's the, the bicycle lanes and the bicycle garages. And it's scattered around uh, all the places where people can park their bicycles. And that makes it uh, really a challenge how to improve this train station even further, how to improve it more. And we are also thinking maybe we should, uh, we are at the limit of the, 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 the system of bikes and trains in the current uh, um, uh, service level of the trains. Maybe we should change the service level of the trains because we cannot park uh, all the bikes anymore at the train stations. It's a nice problem to have. Uh, it's a longer term uh, goal for you because uh, I think for you a thing and, and, and a structure like this is very appealing already. Uh, a, a garage, uh, an open air garage, uh, this is in Alphen aan de Rijn. It was constructed eight years ago. Um, it's a spiral uh, giving access, easy access uh, from the street level, but also from the tunnel level and also easy access to the uh, platform. Because that's what we learned. People who want to rush to get the train, they don't care about their bike. They want to leave it somewhere. And you have to make it convenient, otherwise people won't use the, 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 the facilities you have for them. Well, the very simple ones are these, like uh, these are at the bus stop. Just park your bike and uh, you can see behind the trees that there is a bus stop. This works for most places uh, very well. Um, uh, for us, uh, we found that if we can uh, increase the number of bike racks at the, at the bus stops. This also helps for us in, uh, uh, to encourage people to use public transport. I'll leave you with the last one. Uh, this, uh, uh, another bus stop, it was brand new. We installed a pump uh, uh, next to it. Very simple things, we often forgotten, people have to pump their tires. Well. If you uh, make these kind of simple uh, solutions for people, uh, and they are very, very grateful for what you are doing. And that's uh, what I wanted to show you. Stop Great. This. Thank you so much, Herbert. And I yep. will now uh, pass the floor to Leonard uh, for his presentation. Thank you, Chris, and thanks for having me on this webinar. My name is Leonard Naud. I'm the manager of international strategy with Mobicon. We are a um, Dutch sustainable mobility consultancy from um, based in Delft in the Netherlands, um, but we also have an office in both Ottawa and in Durham, North Carolina nowadays. So we do quite a bit of work in uh, North America and we see that the demand is growing. We have actually done some work for the city of Waterloo recently on the Laurel Trail. Um, so we're quite familiar with the environment. Uh, I was there in February, my last trip before <laughs> everything happened. So that was ironic, um, but here we are. Um, yeah, so this is our team. We, our mission is to help the world uh, be less dependent on a car. And that means we're not anti-car, but we just want to make sure that people have the choice to use a car when they can and need to, but it shouldn't be their, their only way to get around the city. I'm going to skip that. Um, today, I have, a, I have a couple of topics. One is the uh, design of corridors, so uh, separated bike facilities, how to get people actually to those train stations that Herbert was uh, talking about. Uh, we know you're, you're currently in, in the process of planning and building a new train station in Kitchener, uh, which is something that we'd like to contribute a little bit to in, in, in terms of thinking. Um, and as Herbert said, you, you can see in the Netherlands the, the, the integrated way that the infrastructure and the network is tied to the train station is quite crucial in the, in the, in the 
in the success of the, the transit and bike combination. Um, but I'd like to take one step back and look a little bit broader at corridor design, um, also the transition from temporary to permanent um, solutions and retrofits to, um, to final design um, uh, options that you have. And then we're gonna do a very brief rundown of protected intersection design because I think that's a crucial part to um, make cyclists arrive at their destination in a safe way. Um, so first, uh, street design or corridor design in general. At a fundamental level, what, what we see a lot is that people consider it road design um, and they conflate road design and street design. To use a road designing manual to design a street um, and that's quite a different um, beast. So in the Netherlands there's two types of streets in the urban areas basically, if you simplify it a little bit. Uh, there's a distributor or arterial road that looks like something on the left, that's the base drawing. Um, and has been replicated in uh, Canada with a street on the right, more traditional, uh, more separation asphalt street, um, that kind of stuff, probably a 50 kilometer per hour speed limit. Uh, and you're relying on signage and probably um, traffic lights to, to manage the traffic flow. And then there's the access streets or residential streets where you should be relying on lower speed, more communication between users of the street to figure out who's got a right of way. Uh, definitely no uh, traffic lights and very little signage and markings if you can. And those two, um, those two design philosophies actually turn out very different uh, results because you can see that this is a very minimal street with very little um, traffic engineering actually going on while the first one had a lot more stuff and signs and, and, and markings and that's a, that's an important thing to distinguish um, then if you if you've seen uh, I am not entirely sure how much of this has happened in, in the Kitchener and uh, Waterloo region um, but we've seen around the world a lot of um, yeah very quick implementation schemes of separated bike facilities um, and today, I'd like, yeah, I'd like to have a, give you a, a, a strategy, but also a word of warning on how to transform from from a very temporary uh, facility onto a more traditional, uh, real longer term facility. But that it is very important to do that or to take that step at some stage. Uh, this is an example from Auckland in New Zealand, uh, where I used to work, um, and this is one of my former colleagues who took this photo, where they uh, on day one just put out the cones. Very simple, just put the cones out, take a lane from the cars, or in this case, the buses, um, and make it pedestrian space. Um, but what they found is the pedestrians actually don't like using this space because it doesn't look or feel like pedestrian space. So they needed to do more. So then a couple of weeks later, they put in the, the flexi posts or the wands, depends on how you want to call them. Um, and that gave people a little bit more physical separation, but they're also not very um, sturdy. So it still feels like a, um, a space for cars or buses instead of pedestrian or cycle space. Um, so then they, they, they came back and they were like, well, this actually works quite well. Um, so we'll put down concrete barriers and make the separation more permanent. Um, and then what really made the change is to paint it, make it a different color. Uh, use a resin, they, they use white, um, which I think looks very sophisticated. Um, but that really indicated, look, this is no longer a street space for cars. It's no longer black asphalt, but it's very different. Um, but they did this not just because they had an, a busy street, it is a busy street, but th that wasn't the only reason, but they had a, an agenda because longer term, this is the vision for the street. So while they used the, the, the COVID um, crisis for a, 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 as a reason to implement something very quickly, they did have a backup strategy in their minds about where they were going to go with this. And that gave them the, the legitimate reason to actually make these changes more permanent. Uh, but also to see how the street would function if you had to have a different um, different layout. So that's what I would like to give you as a message today. If you do have temporary facilities, if you have some open streets programs, um, don't leave them in as, as flexi posts and ball arts for too long because people will start to hate the look of them. Um, and as, as soon as the emergency goes away, because I heard you're vaccinating now as well, as if that goes away, your, region, your reason for, for doing something has fallen away and um, so make sure you back it up with a strategy for more longer term change um, and that leads me to the next uh, topic of um, if you want to have that permanent change um, and if you want to really um, capitalize on the on the programs you're doing there's a few things that that you shouldn't forget when um, 
drawing out new infrastructure types, uh, especially when you're not retrofitting, but uh, really starting from scratch. So for example, if there's a sewer upgrade and you need to rip up the whole road, or if there's a greenfield development uh, where a big developer wants to come in and build some residential streets, that's a really a moment where you should uh, have your standards at the ready and only accept best practice. Don't, don't settle for a shared path because the, the uh, developer doesn't want to pay for a proper cycle track. A shared path can have their, their, their place, but it's not shouldn't be the default option for uh, people on bikes. Uh, also bi-directional cycleways, they can be very useful for implementing something because they're space efficient and they might avoid some political kerfuffle over lost parking spots. But in a newly built uh, neighborhood, for example, there's no reason to settle for bi-directionals when you in one swoop, swoop can do a unidirectional cycleways, which are uh, best practice. Also, don't try not overbuild your car lanes. They really don't need to be four, four and a half meters wide. Uh, looking at Winnipeg for that one, they have a four and a half, five meter wide lanes because, because snow, they said. And I was like, well, I don't think five meters is necessary for snow. So try and, and be clever with that. Don't make it, if it, if it doesn't work in summer, um, because it's so wide for winter, then you've lost half the year and you made it actually quite unsafe because wider roads uh, ask for higher speeds or they get people to drive faster. So that's all not very necessary. And this, this example from the, on the left uh, shows what you can do. This was all developer built, um, but they said, we just, want, we just want to build like this. And the developer said, yeah, that's, that's fine. It, the, the price difference is not actually that crazy. And if you really want it, we'll, we'll, we'll build it for you. Then, uh, intersections. This is normally a full uh, hour and a half uh, masterclass, which I'm going to give to you in about three minutes. So hang on to your helmets. Here we go. Uh, there's two types of intersections, which comes back to that, um, that street versus road design. Uh, a very simple intersection in the Netherlands between two residential streets looks like this. No signage, no markings, nothing. You just rely on people knowing the right of way. Uh, you give way to cars from the right, regardless of where you're coming from. Um, and you just manage and to, to slow down and give way to whoever you want to. So that's very little traffic engineering, very little signage, which is a, a good way um, to, to operate. And it works because the speed is low. At 50 kilometers an hour, this is very difficult. But at 30 or 20, it's actually fine. If you have a larger street where a, a road meets a street, this is an example from around the corner from my house in Utrecht, <clears throat> you can see that there's a, like an entryway or gateway treatment, we call it. Uh, where you have the, the cycleway and the footpath continue and all the drivers or cars uh, entering or exiting the side street need to give way to all the, the, the road users on the main road. Um, and that might sound um, exotic, but it's actually been replicated in Kenmore, Alberta, uh, where they've come up with this. It's slightly different. Again, snow clearance. You can see that there's not as many uh, curbs, for example, so the sweeper or the, the, the snowplow can actually use it. Um, they have a lot of snow, <laughs> um, but it, it, it does give the same message about who has priority. Even without knowing any Canadian road rules, you can see I'm going to wait in my, if I'm driving and I want to turn into the side street, I'm going to wait here and give way to these people crossing because their, their footpath is continuous. Although these people are walking on the cycleway, but let's go to the next one. Uh, and then if there's two large uh, roads meeting um, and you do need traffic lights, uh, our preferred way is a roundabout, but we'll not venture into that topic today because that was really too much. Um, but if you have traffic lights and you want them um, to operate safely, the protected intersection is really the way to go. Um, there's a few fundamentals um, that I'll quickly run through. Uh, so protected, some of you might have seen this already, but the protected intersection has a two-stage left turn and a free right, uh, which kind of balances out. So for cyclists, it's not actually that much extra of delay, a little bit sometimes, but not necessarily. And with some smart signal phasing, you can actually avoid some of that. Um, it has a, a setback from uh, for the cars and the bikeway. So the bike bikeway bends out a little bit, which allows drivers to be able to see cyclists much easier because they don't have to bend their head 120 degrees over their shoulder, for example. Um, and there's more of a 90 degree angle between driver and cyclist. Um, and you have some vertical protection in the corner and that's what makes it a protected intersection. And that's what makes Dutch people so smug when they talk to Danish people because they often forget this little corner island. Um, and that's why we like protected islands over the Danish uh, version because a cyclist sitting in that corner it has no physical protection if that curb is missing in the blue. 
Um, and that also allows for a setback more to the front, uh, or set front actually. So you have a lateral and a longitudinal shift. So the cyclist is moved five or six meters to the right of the car waiting at the stop line, but also about 10 meters in front of the car, which makes, well, you can imagine if you're sitting at a traffic light, you can see the cyclist in the corner of your eye. So when you're gonna start to turn right, you already know that somebody's there waiting to cross as well. And that avoids a lot of um, unexpected conflict. And then in the middle, we, we prefer a raised median, although it is not always uh, possible, but if, if possible, uh, please include a raised median, uh, which gives uh, pedestrians a, a safe haven to, to wait if something happens along the way. Um, they should be able to cross in one go, the whole intersection, obviously, but if something happens, they can wait there. But it also makes the cars turn slower because those blue islands you see sticking out into the traffic light, and they reduce the turning circle for a car, so they can't take this intersection at 80 kilometers an hour anymore. And then one thing that we always want to stress is please put the cyclists on the inside and not on the outside. We've seen examples also from Ottawa uh, where they are experimenting with flipping the cyclist to the outside. It has some advantages for signaling. Um, apparently, I haven't seen the results yet, but um, it doesn't uh, help in terms of predictability of the intersection. Cyclists are always on the inside along the roads leading into the intersection and they should stay there so people know when to expect a cyclist from which side. Um, it's a long story, I can tell you more about this when because it does, um, if you put cyclists on the inside, you're expected to have more conflicts between bikes and pedestrians, but I'll leave that for now because that's a whole another presentation. Now, we're not the only ones building this. Uh, you might have seen some around Canada. I want to have a few, uh, bring up a few highlights, which I think are, are good. Well, I'm a little bit biased about this one because uh, we designed it. Uh, but this one is in Canmore, uh, Alberta again. It's currently under construction. And as you can see, it's got a lot of the elements that we, that we like, uh, the, the islands, the median, uh, the, corner, the corner islands. Uh, and they have um, bi-directional cycleways on all sides, which is interesting and not something we necessarily would have preferred, uh, but given the network of their cycleways, they're mostly shared paths still, um, they needed a bi-directional because otherwise it was gonna be very difficult. So they do have full protection for cyclists on the, on the lights. So there's no conflicts there. Then one from Ottawa, um, which I think ticks a lot of the boxes um, misses a couple of little details, but we'll, we'll let that slide. So this is a, Ottawa is actually building quite a few of these at the moment, which is, is looking great. Um, another one from Ottawa where you can see a very smooth uh, right turn uh, and you don't even have to have protected cycle facilities on all legs to make this worthwhile. A lot of the crashes happen between bikes and cars happen at the intersection. Um, so if you can make the intersection safer, it's actually okay. Well, it's not okay. You prefer to have separated cycleways on all approaches, but if they're not, it's not a reason not to build a protected intersection. Uh, one other nice detail, which I think is, is really good, is this, uh, this gray area you can see um, here, which is kind of like a rumble strip, uh, which makes cars, little cars, turn the corner a little bit uh, wider and that's a little bit slower and that reduces the speed of the car while still maintaining access for larger trucks and for snow plows for example. Um, well, yeah, Vancouver is also building them, probably no surprises there. I think their curbs are too high, but you know, we're getting really nitty gritty now and <laughs> but their, their goals are good. Um, it doesn't always go well. Here's a bit awkward pole placement, which I think is hilarious. Um, but it, it does show that if you have the right intentions, um, make sure that you have a good, a lot of attention to detail, even in the construction drawings and in the evaluation when you run through the, the project with the contractor. Make sure it's all done correctly because those things are important. Um, attention to detail and cycle infrastructure is much more important than for cars, I think, um, because a successful, the difference for a very successful intersection versus a, a mediocre intersection is very, very little. So that's something I would uh, advise you to have good attention to detail when planning these things. Then one last topic, if this gets too technical, feel free to zone out for a little bit, but I think it is an important one to bring up and that's near-side signals. Um, in 
Canada and the US, the, 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 the regulations ask for far side signals, which means that the signals are placed on the far end of the, of the intersection. So you'll see this is kind of like a, my, my beautiful Photoshop skills at work. The, the, the sight line of the driver is aimed at that light in the far side of the intersection. And that can be 20, 30, 40 meters away, which means that they're not paying attention at anything closer by. Um, in the Netherlands, the, the, the default is to place the, the signals on the near side of the intersection, which means that if you want to turn right, for example, you're looking at uh, this direction, which means that you're paying much more attention to, to, to pedestrians or cyclists crossing uh, on the side that you're going to uh, have a potential conflict with. Um, again, I, I sound like a broken record, but Kenmore is building uh, near side signals on that large intersection that I showed you before. So keep an eye on that little town. They're doing very progressive stuff. Um, I know it's not legal under current regulations, but uh, maybe as a trial, it would be advisable to give that a go at some stage. And we can help you figure out how the signaling works and stuff. So there was a lot. Um, I do have one uh, little sales pitch if you want to sign up, if you want to know more about this kind of stuff. We do have a, a, an online webinar platform uh, and you can sign up on academy.mobicon.com uh, where we have a selection of uh, about an hour long webinars on all kinds of fun topics from uh, intersection design roundabouts, but also how to teach an adult how to ride a bike or the exam for example, how to design school zones uh, safely. Um, it is cheaper than Netflix and a great Christmas present. <laughs> so with that, I'll give the floor back to Chris. You okay? Thanks so much, Leonard. That was uh, an absolute whirlwind. I hope uh, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> no, uh, it was great. Um, yeah, we have a, a, a coffee break scheduled, but um, uh, Leonard's actually double booked and has to uh, step out in about seven minutes. So um, he has his colleague uh, Justin here, uh, who will also be available to answer questions. But um, feel free to to take a, a minute for a coffee or a washroom break. But otherwise. Um, you can you can type your questions into the chat box and, and we can get started on the Q&A uh, whenever. Um, there was a, a quick question, Leonard, that I'll direct your, to you um, in regards to the, the Canmore example with bi-directional cycle tracks on each leg. Um, do, do bikes still have to go in that unidirectional circle around the intersection? Um, and what is, what is compliance expected to be like for that? Yeah. A good question. They, they can actually, they have a lot of freedom because all of the crossings are bi-directional as well. They're all cross rides, uh, which means that they can, um, they, they can take whichever route is quickest if they have to go to the other side. So whichever green light comes on first, uh, that's the direction they can go in first. So it's, it's, it's quite uh, seamless. The way they phased it is they basically give uh, one side green and then straight after the other side gets green. So it's like a, uh, yeah, <laughs> gets a bit technical again. Um, but it's, it's well phased for uh, cyclists. So we hope compliance is good. But it is the reason why we said you'd better have bi-directional crossings because otherwise compliance is going to be horrific. Excellent. Okay. Um, yeah. So please feel free to, to drop uh, questions into the chat box. Um, I'm going to ask, actually ask Herbert a question because uh, this part was a little bit unclear in your presentation uh, in regards to the last mile solutions. The, the fact that this, um, the bike parking uh, works in the Netherlands and because people don't take their bikes on the trains um, is only really workable because people have a, a rental bike solution at the other end of their trip and they can use their, their smart cards, uh, the same card that they use to access the trains to, to rent a bicycle for the last leg of their journey. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and explain how that works? Yes, sure. Um, uh, first of all, um, currently at this moment, uh, we have in the Netherlands uh, uh, around 15% uh, of all the people that uh, have their egress trip, so from the train station to the destination that are cycling. And uh, we think we can increase this uh, number. Um, most people, they uh, have now their destination within walking distance uh, of the train station. So they walk there uh, uh, maybe one mile to their destination and that's it. It can increase by uh, uh, a second bike or preferably uh, 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 a rental bike. Uh, then it's 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 much better. The the rental bike system in the Netherlands it's it's uh, operated by the Dutch Railways. 
Um, it's for every train station. It, it works more or less the same. You have your travel card, which is also standardized in the Netherlands. Uh, you can use it uh, in the south, in the north, everywhere in Amsterdam, on the bus, trains, uh, metro, and even some boats. Um, this travel card allows you to uh, uh, sign up uh, for the, the rental scheme. Um, you uh, grab a bike, you uh, take it and then uh, uh, it's scanned, the card is scanned, the bike is scanned and then you're connected. When you hand in your bike again, it's scanned again and then uh, in the end of the month uh, you receive a bill. In that way it has become uh, extremely successful. We started 20 years ago with maybe three stations, five stations. Uh, with uh, 75 bicycles, we have now in the Netherlands over 20,000 bicycles on 315 train stations and those bikes make over uh, uh, 3 million trips a year. So it has, been, it has grown and it's, uh, well, until last year, this year, it was growing in, with double digits. Um, uh, it has become less successful because people are traveling less, but we have now different groups as people try to avoid uh, buses, uh, try to avoid trams. So there's now different groups that are using it uh, during the COVID-19 period. But we are very, are very uh, curious how it will develop in the future because we now found new people that might use it. Wonderful. Thanks, Herbert. Uh, so Leonard, before you disappear, I'll, I'll get your uh, your thoughts on the uh, best practice for integrating bus stops with segregated mm -hmm. cycling facilities. Can you say a few words about that? Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of the the boarding island, uh, the race boarding island. Get people to to step off the bus first, so they can land in a place that is safe and that is not a conflict zone. Um, get the bikes to go around the back uh, if you can. You usually can, um, not. Always there is unique circumstances when it really doesn't fit and then maybe an on-road bike lane is, is the way to go, depending on the bus frequency as well. Um, but yeah, in any case, try and avoid conflict as you step off the bus because that just sounds scary to me. I want to be able to step off the bus in peace. <laughs> and I also don't want to have to ride past the bus stop at five kilometers an hour because somebody might step off the bus. So yeah, conflict avoidance. Uh, don't 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 listen too much to the UK in this example. I think because they have really tough fights over bus boarding islands, which is sounds silly to me. <laughs> and there was a relatively high-profile case recently in Victoria where they were uh, there was a human rights uh, complaint about uh, people with uh, sight uh, impairments, and and uh, there was a claim that uh, this this floating bus stop was discriminated against them. Did you have any? Uh, thoughts on that, or I, I haven't. I haven't. Learned, I didn't know about this particular case. Um, I think if you if you can and you separate the modes, everybody has a chance to just take their time and and relax. I think putting people in unsuspecting circumstances where they they make a move that they need to do and they're instantly in a potential conflict zone is by all means worse. And I I, I really don't see how that could be a human rights violation. Um, especially if you put a zebra crossing, for example, across the, the cycle track, which clearly indicates that, yes, if you are a cyclist, you do have to give way to people on the, on the, on the zebra crossing, um, but you don't, yeah, you don't have to hit them as soon as they step off the bus. I think that's a good compromise. Yeah, there was some kind of comment about the bicyclists being silent, and, and so the, the, uh, that was a concern. The silent cyclist, yeah, it's very dangerous. Uh, cy cyclist pedestrian uh, ca uh, casualties do not happen. There's maybe one or two every decade. And if we would treat cars with the same, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, as credulous, if we would be so good at looking at the safety of cars and pedestrians, we would have banned them outright about 50 years ago. So that's always a bit of a funny. People focus a lot on the single crash that happens between a bike and a pedestrian. And it's like, guys, big picture, big picture. Amen. Um, uh, do you have to go now, Leonard, or do you have time for? I can. I see Cornell asked about the uh, near side signals. I can answer that one. Okay. That's a quick, Perfect. That's a quick yes. Uh, the near side signal in Canmore is that for uh, bikes and cars? Uh, yes, it is for bikes and cars. They have overhead near side signals for cars and then um, near side signals for bikes as well, but they're actually placed further 
uh, away because the bikes are positioned further to the front uh, of the stop line. If you can imagine what that looked like. So they have, um, yeah, near that signals for cars, which is, I think, the first in North America. Okay. Now we're going to talk a little bit about winter snow maintenance. Um, is it best to perhaps bring in Justin for that uh, that topic? And, and Herbert, did you have some? some I thoughts? saw snow once. It was great. <laughs> it was a Wednesday. The Wednesday that it was winter. <laughs> yeah. Happy to defer to other people for that one. Justin, did you have uh, anything to share on on uh, cycle track maintenance uh, during the winter time? Maybe how the city of Ottawa. I'm going to duck out. So uh, good luck, Justin. Thank you. Um, nice to see you all. If you have any questions, uh, my email address is in the slides, so you can always send me an email later. Enjoy. Thanks, Leonard. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't think I have a ton to add uh, on winter maintenance. I, I think the number thing, number one thing, is just uh, to fund it, and um, the more the more frequently you can do it, the better. It's it's not it's not uh, complicated as long if you have the money. Um, so I think, uh, you know, our, our experience, you know, not from the city's perspective, but here in Ottawa is, um, you know, the facilities that see winter maintenance get use and the ones that don't, don't get use. So um, I, I don't think you have to worry as much about whether people are going to use it. If you do clear them, you just have to, you know, make that, make that first step. Herbert, I know you're, you're quite, actually quite active in the Winter Cycling Congress and, and, and have done a fair bit of traveling in places like Finland and uh, can you maybe share what what best practices in, in those countries around cycle track maintenance in the winter time? Yeah, in those countries, um, it's remarkable they are not using salt, uh, as in North America and Canada. They uh, they are just uh, uh, blowing uh, the snow away, and they have a, a, a thin layer of packed uh, uh, snow where people can ride their bikes in winter time. Um, if you have a winter, I don't know exactly how the winters in, in Waterloo Kitchener are, um, but if you have a stable uh, temperature below zero, then it's okay. But uh, when it's fluctuating all the time, in, well, then it becomes icy. And that's also uh, some places in, in, in Sweden, in, in Finland, it's also becoming uh, uh, more difficult. To, and then they have workshops where people can uh, change their uh, summer tires for winter tires and uh, people are ju just do that uh, in the winter season. It really works well with spikes and also they are gritting uh, their uh, cycle tracks and their pedestrian uh, 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 sideways because uh, gritting uh, is giving comfort, giving grip uh, to people walking and cycling. Okay, uh, the next question is more a question of uh, route selection or, or network. Uh, and, and Justin, maybe you can share your thoughts on um, choosing routes that are on high volume multi lane arterial roads versus perhaps uh, going on lower stress parallel routes. Um, what do you typically advise cities when it comes to um, choosing streets for, for cycling? Yeah, I, I think this is um, comes to a matter of kind of prioritization and phasing. Um, I, I think from the, from the Dutch perspective, the the first policy is that you need to start finding ways to get those accesses off the arterial routes. Um, so when redevelopment happens, make sure you don't maintain access off the main roads. Uh, but um, uh, but I mean, uh, there's 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 also two sides, which is that there's through traffic for cyclists and access. So if you have a lot of destinations on the main route, you, you, you're still going to need a safe cycling facility. Otherwise, uh, the parallel route isn't going to get people to their destination. Whereas if it's functioning mainly as a through route, the uh, lower volume, quieter, more comfortable parallel route may be preferable for a lot of cyclists. So I don't, I don't think it's cut and dry. Um, uh, eventually, you probably need both. But um, I think those are some of the considerations to keep in mind. Yeah, I mean, Herbert, do you have anything to share in terms of the province and city of Utrecht and how they've approached this? Yeah, well, mm, we have a different uh, starting point. Um, we had cycling already for a long time. So uh, given the situation in, in a lot of cities in Canada, I would say, uh, well, uh, don't talk about if, if you start on busy roads or uh, the, the other roads start to uh, define your network first and the direct routes that people want to take. We often see uh, beautiful plans of uh, cycleways next to rivers and they are bending along uh, 
journey and it's great for summer cycling for for recreation but it's knowing not going from a to b if you want to go from a to b as a daily cyclist you want to have the shortest route and if it's a busy route people will use it because it saves them time and then make it safe um, if it's not a busy route then it's perfect but if it's busy route well then you have to separate it uh, uh, protect people that are cycling there okay. uh, a couple more questions about the protected intersection justin i'm not sure if you're uh, able to handle these but uh, there was a question about the placement of the near side uh, traffic lights um and uh making them easy for the drivers to see uh, do you have any kind of insight in terms of um where the 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 height and the the placement of the traffic lights is ideal for the driver yeah I, i'm not sure about the exact height i mean I, i'm sure they kind of uh, fall under a lot of the same challenges we have here which is that you know you have to make sure the buses and trucks can fit underneath them and nothing's uh impinging but i i think one of the inherent uh, safety elements of uh, near side signals is that they are difficult to see if you go past them. So uh, it, it's kind of a self reinforcing system, which is that by placing the signals on the near side, you're required as a driver to stop in advance of the stop bar and not infringe on the crosswalk. Because if you do, you're not going to be able to see when your signal turns green. So, so there is an element there of um, behavior modification. Uh, which is that the position of the signals reinforces where you need to see, where you need to stop. Otherwise, uh, you're not going to be able to kind of participate in the uh, intersection. That's a great point. Um, and then someone was also asking about uh, the the placement of the bullnose and how that may impact the uh, turning radius for larger trucks uh, making left turns in a protected intersection. Yeah, I, I think a lot of times it will. Um, it, you, you, you still have to run your same turn templates. Um, and I think similar to a, a regular corner rate AI, you can, you can use a, a truck apron on a bullnose if it's big enough, um, if it needs to infringe a little bit. Uh, you know, Dutch intersections are often much more constrained and they just don't permit the same size trucks in their urban areas. Um, so I think it's still doable. You just, uh, you know, kind of use good engineering. Uh, and there's one other question about the protected intersection and uh, Cornell is wondering about your thoughts on green bike boxes versus the the kind of protected corners and what are the the trade-offs when you're you're just putting in uh, painted bike boxes uh, I was, I'm just trying to find the is it, was, it in the chat it was accidentally sent to me privately I can copy and paste it into the uh, the box right now Yeah, I, well, I, I think I think bike boxes. I mean, um, they have they potentially have their place in kind of a short term, you know, re repaving um, context where you maybe don't have the funds or ability to move curb lines, and you really can't make a protected intersection fit. Um, but uh, similar to what Leonard was saying, is a, a bike box doesn't provide any physical protection, and, and I think it, it also doesn't facilitate uh, a left turn very well. Um, unless the traffic light is red. So the bike box really is only relevant if you arrive at a red light. Uh, if you don't arrive at a red light, if it's green, um, you, you're kind of out of luck there. So I, I think it, it provides a, a marginal improvement over no bike box, but it's, it's not a substitute for a, a properly designed protected intersection. Okay. Uh, when we have uh, two lanes uh, in the same direction, uh, you don't want to have a bike box uh, in front of those uh, double lanes. Uh, it's unsafe. So it's yeah. recommended to model it. I would agree. Signal it, single lane only. Yeah. Um, so there's uh, yeah, a question about uh, visual impairments and, and people on these continuous walkways that, that stretch across the side streets. And whether there's a risk with them uh, being unaware that they're actually crossing a street um, and, and that cars may be turning into their space. Uh, that's a good question. It, that's not something I've come across before. I guess um, in, in, in our experience, the, that's, uh, well, I mean, uh, that's kind of the point, I guess, in some regards, which is that the street is really deprioritized. The same way we don't treat every, inter, uh, every driveway, especially, along a sidewalk, uh, you know, we kind of 
we basically tell the users that the sidewalk is for the pedestrians and anyone that's you know infringing on that space you know it's their duty of care to make sure uh, they're not going to cross so um, if you're going to build a continuous sidewalk across the side street uh, you're basically deciding that that side street is now behaving like a driveway uh, and you know use all the same uh, approaches you would for um, you know ADA you know accessibility design as you would at a regular driveway okay um, yeah we're, we're out of questions so if anyone has the uh, additional questions please uh, drop them in the chat box I'm gonna ask Herbert uh, a question about uh, light rail and, and cycling because I know Waterloo region is in the process of building out a light rail system Utrecht uh, just opened its first couple of light rail lines are there any other uh, uh, different design elements that are going into combining the bicycle and the and the the tram versus uh, the regional or, or national train network. Um, no, actually, no. Um, it, it's more or less the same, although the the size uh, of the, the the scale is different that you want to uh, attract people from. So, uh, given the uh, a train station in Utrecht, uh, it serves uh, people from five or even seven to 12 kilometers that are cycling to the train station. Uh, a bus stop or a, 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 a light rail might serve people maybe two kilometers away from the, the stop. So in that way, it, it's more or less the same. And then uh, the volumes of uh, uh, bicycles at the at bus stop, uh, well, they are less but still they can be quite a lot. We have uh, bus stops uh, in Utrecht uh, where we have over 100 uh, bicycles parked because it's a very attractive uh, point. And also it's the last uh, bus stop uh, in, the, in the city itself. So people tend to cycle to the end of the city, to the border and then uh, hop on the bus because uh, well, outside it's, it's, it's dangerous or something or they don't know the route or it's too windy or the, the, the road conditions, uh, well, don't feel good, uh, not safe anymore. So people tend to, to cycle to the end uh, of the, the build-up area and then hop on, on, the, on the light rail or on the bus. Uh, also, it's, it's cheaper because you're uh, charged uh, by every 100 meters. So the more you cycle, the more you save. Great. Uh, question for you, Justin. Do you know, I, I've never seen this acronym before, TWISI, truncated domes. So they always used to cross the cycle track at the intersection. Yeah. Uh, well, we affectionately refer to them as Twizzies, though I've heard that that's very much an Ottawa thing. And I've, uh, I don't know if a lot of other places call them Twizzies, but um, yeah, truncated domes, so tactile surface, tactile walking indicators. Um, yeah, I, I think. Um, uh, uh, Actions pretty much always used in advance, uh, and I think North America, to be fair, is doing perhaps more in some ways on accessible design uh, than the Dutch are. So that's something maybe you know knowledge can go both ways there. Um, but the, the Dutch also use rather than just the uh, kind of the domes at the intersection, they also use a lot of positive reinforcement. So they'll have the linear the linear strips to guide people along the sidewalk to the intersection, rather than just kind of having the alert at the intersection itself. Um, so, okay. I, Herbert, if you want to add to that, by all means. Um, no, it's 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 what you say. We we are very flexible in in how to uh, uh, make a street instead of a road. Um, I was already uh, reading the next uh, question from Darren. Follow up uh, the volumes that people were uh, uh, that we are using for the continuous uh, walkway. It's around uh, two and a half thousand uh, that we say that is still considered to be okay. If it's more vehicles per day, then uh, you should uh, make a, a different road layout. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, we're we're out of questions. So if anybody, uh, Cornell's just added. Uh, what do you use to detect bicycles at signals? Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, I guess, a question around VRIs and, and uh, yep. what, what kind of technology is used at uh, intersections. We use all kinds of technologies. Uh, uh, the best one is, of course, uh, most of the times it's the adduction loops uh, before the, the, 
uh, traffic lights. We have the, the short loops at the, at the stop line, but also 20 meters before that uh, the, you can calculate. Um, we also use uh, radar, we use thermocams uh, that you can uh, detect a uh, peloton of uh, people cycling and then you can uh, extend the, the green phase. Uh, we also uh, uh, use nowadays even uh, phones to detect people. People can switch on their phone and uh, uh, as they are approaching a, 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 a special a dedicated uh, traffic light, um, the signal goes directly to the, 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 the control of the, the traffic lights and then it's detected already. So which uh, every technique that is available, the carbon bikes are sometimes uh, a problem with the detection loops. So just in case, also people are demanding a pole with a push button, a back button, people want to have it. Also to lean on it, to wait for it. Um, but also uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's a fallback uh, function. If the detection loop doesn't work, then you still have the option to to uh, uh, ask for priority. And I think post, post COVID, I've seen a lot of cities are actually um, switching their back buttons off and, and, and relying solely on the detection loops, uh, which is kind of an interesting development. Um, yeah, Justin, any, any general tips on, on bi-directional protected intersection design? Uh, I know it's not best practice, but uh, is there anything we can we can offer in terms of uh, do's and don'ts uh, if if we do have to uh, design bi-directional uh, through an intersection? Yeah, I, I think our, our first steps would base you know other than try not to um, you know we as we saw in Canmore sometimes it's necessary or even desirable for network reasons uh, so the first is basically you know use all the other measures you have to make the intersection as safe as possible so don't compromise on the by having the bi-directional and then have a less than ideal setback. So make sure you've got that kind of four to six meter setback from the adjacent lane. Um, you can raise the crossing uh, would be kind of ideal to really ensure that vehicles crossing it are um, going slowly. You know, at a larger intersection, that may mean raising the whole intersection. Um, protected phasing is kind of always your, uh, maybe your first choice. So uh, when you do have a bi-directional cycling facility through a signalized intersection, uh, try and make sure the cyclists don't don't have any conflicting movements with vehicles. That's you know, that that's kind of your first um, way to mitigate the added safety concerns with uh, bi-directional facilities. So I'd say that's right. that my first first choices. And carrying that red asphalt through the intersection, I think, is also critical and, and something most Dutch people don't even think about now. But that red carpet and and that visual cue is is quite important. Um, Herbert, can you talk a little or bit green about for those of us? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Herbert, can you talk a little, little bit about that asphalt uh, practice or, or the mix? Uh, do you know um, technically what that that consists of? Um, yes, um, technically, it, the red asphalt is mostly made in the Netherlands of a, a, a regular asphalt with a with a color in it. Um, sometimes they are using. Too much color and uh, also uh, a blank bitumen. I don't know exactly if it's correct, um, but that uh, uh, sometimes is uh, is not uh, really working well, and especially in winters, uh, and the, the bitumen get loose and then it, it, it degenerates uh, really quickly. So, what I would suggest is having. Uh, 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 more than a red stone in, into the asphalt because uh, it's lasting for a longer time and also it, it bonds better and also for uh, reducing heat stress in, in, in summer times it's really useful to have a, a lighter color of uh, uh, your asphalt. Um, we did some uh, uh, experiments with the colors of asphalt and uh, especially in the Netherlands um, well, the, the, the climate is changing. Even if we stop tomorrow with emitting uh, carbon dioxide, the temperature will rise two degrees. And that means our summers will be more hot and then uh, our cities are suffering from heat stress. So we need to, to make it uh, more adapted to that. 
you have more or less uh, uh, a concrete uh, tradition and concrete by itself is, is already a light color so that's good for you. Justin, was I, my understanding was that Canmore was a red tinted concrete, is that correct? Yeah, they, they had tried to, um, their, their preference was initially for uh, asphalt, but um, it was basically going to end up being more expensive to source uh, colored asphalt in uh, Canmore, so it was cheaper for them to dye concrete, so that's what they did. I, I'm not sure if that's what they're continuing to do for all of their new facilities, but I know um, for a lot of them that's what they've, they've done. And as far as you know, is that that's held up and, and is uh, maintainable in, in the Canadian climate? Yeah, as I, I mean, uh, I've been there a couple times now, I think, and it's, yeah, I mean, it looks almost as new, though. I mean, it's only a couple years old uh, at the oldest. But yeah, um, we haven't heard any negative feedback from them. Okay, uh, there's another question about uh, separating pedestrians and cyclists, and I'd love to hear from both of you in terms of uh, what you would recommend as a minimum threshold of volumes uh, when you want to start uh, uh, separating people from, with people walking from people cycling? I, I can start. Um, yeah. we, we've got some, some research, mainly in the context of kind of like a shopping district, which gives you some calculations on uh, basically pedestrian density. So it's uh, like a number of pedestrians per meter per hour. Uh, and there's different thresholds. Um, because essentially what happens is the more pedestrians you have, the bicyclists just have to kind of cope with the pedestrians. So, so at the end of the day, it kind of comes down to uh, the level of bike, bicycle service you want to provide in that space. Um, when it comes to multi-use paths, I think um, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a different conversation because we're looking a, a lot at kind of the quality, the quality of the experience for both users. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if it's necessarily a threshold um, discussion. We, we would just say when, when you can separate them because uh, as soon as you get any reasonable volume of either user, they're going to start complaining about each other. Yeah. yeah, that was certainly my experience in Vancouver and, and parts of the seawall. They were kind of separated on a on a demand basis with the segments that had the most complaints uh, became the ones where they were separating pedestrians from cyclists um yeah what is what is uh, utrecht's policy uh, i guess separate where possible and then mix only when necessary yes and we only uh, mix uh, in the in the the shopping area in the in the heart of utrecht and then it's indeed uh, the moment when it becomes more busy with people walking, uh, the number of uh, people cycling uh, declines or they also become pedestrians. They jump, jump off their bikes and they walk the last uh, two meters to the, to the shop. Um, or they take a detour and then uh, uh, it's quicker to make a detour than uh, to, to try to squeeze into the, the pedestrianized area. Uh, what we see more in the outskirts, where we have sometimes uh, mixed use. Um, also by law in the Netherlands, uh, uh, as a pedestrian, you are allowed to use the cycle path if there is no pavement. And then you know uh, uh, that you are more or less the guest at the, at the cycle path. And also the volume of people uh, cycling in the Netherlands, it's, it's much higher than in other countries. So for that reason, uh, uh, um, there's, there's not often a, a conflict between people walking and cycling. People know what are the rules uh, at the cycle path. Um, but also we see people uh, walking their dog, especially at night, uh, that can be a tricky one uh, on the cycle path. And then, uh, 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 yeah, there are sometimes complaints or uh, people uh, get angry at each other. But most of the times, as we are humans and can talk to each other, then it's, it's, a, it's a minor conflict. And I think it's, it's worth emphasizing the point that, that Leonard made, that uh, the Netherlands is statistically one of the, also one of the safest places to walk as, as well as to cycle, and, and that walking is incredibly comfortable and, and safe here. And, and uh, those micro uh, conflicts that happen between pedestrians and cyclists are, are small potatoes in compar comparison to the ones that we accept in, in elsewhere in the world between cars and, and vulnerable road users. 
Um, Justin, there's a, a question of maybe more examples of uh, facilities that Mobicon has, uh, has worked on elsewhere in Canada or America that uh, are in winter cities. And, and uh, uh, do you have any insights in terms of, uh, you know, the, the maintenance management and, and, and best practice there? Um, understanding that, uh, that uh, Kitchener Waterloo is not the Netherlands in terms of climate. Yeah, well, uh, what, uh, you know, looking closer to home for me, Ottawa obviously gets lots of snow um, and we have uh, an ever growing number of facilities, which I'm sure Cornell would be happy to tell you all about as well. Um, so yeah, lo lots of snow clearing happening here. And, and I know on the projects we've worked on uh, in Ottawa, it's, it's always a discussion when it comes down to design. Um, uh, Montreal is doing huge things. They've had separated facilities longer than pretty much anyone else in Canada. Uh, and also probably some of the most severe winters. So um, if, uh, if Montreal can do it. That being said, they, they tend to stay frozen a little longer and Herbert, Herbert kind of uh, alluded to this. Uh, Finland does a packed snow um, kind of treatment versus uh, plowing and salting. Um, but uh, with, uh, with our increasingly kind of freeze thaw cycles in Ontario, it's a little trickier to kind of um, take that approach. Um, and I think Montreal's maybe a little bit in between, but we can definitely look to what they're doing. They're using a lot of brushes alongside plows um, for better uh, maintenance standards. Uh, but I think there's a lot, you know, an increasing number of um, cities we can look to. Edmonton as well is, you know, doing a lot. So um, I can't cover it all right now, but there, we've got a lot of great examples in Canada that are kind of pushing, pushing the limits with very Canadian winters. Um, and uh, Chris, not to jump in, but I, I'll just kind of add, I see Cornell, Cornell's comment here, which is um, basically an add-on to that, which is the flush, flush design between PET and cycling space, uh, which um, from my experience has always been a main, largely a maintenance decision for cities uh, so that they can run the same sidewalk plow over both facilities. Um, I think uh, what, what, we're, we're, what we're seeing is that places that have used a flush design have increasing numbers of um, compliance issues with pedestrians and cyclists between the two, uh, especially pedestrians coming onto the cycle track. Um, it's not their fault. It's just kind of the way you operate when you walk places. Um, and, and then back to the uh, visual, visual impairment, uh, delineating that space between them is increasingly difficult, especially in the winter. So these kind of tactile surface indicators that delineate the side of the cycle track from the sidewalk have needed to get bigger and bigger and darker and more contrast and i think um that challenge is really more readily remedied with a small curb that's you know can be detected with a cane yeah. um what so yeah, that, Herbert, uh, yeah um in, in sweden and finland in the past uh, 40 years they designed uh well uh, uh non-motorized space just as asphalt and then uh well pedestrians and cyclists you have to figure it out yourself you're not in my way as a motor motorist so uh, go ahead and uh, nowadays since cycling has increased a lot and there were a lot of complaints between pedestrians and cyclists um, they started to separate them uh, but not that meant much as great separation because this causes conflicts uh, in winter time and winter maintenance so they have uh, a separation with a rumble strip so three stones next to each other and then asphalt on both sides and one side is for walking one side is for cycling and this works very well because then they can still use the same large truck to to uh, uh, for for snow clearance um, it depends a bit because in the city of helsinki they are really using now uh, curb protection uh, between uh, ped pedestrians and, and cyclists and that's also because it's uh, 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 m very much influenced by the sea and they have a lot of melting water uh, in the winter time. So they need uh, definitely that uh, flush treatment. And I, I was just gonna plug, if you're interested in learning more, um, definitely get involved with the Winter Cycling Congress. Uh, it's wintercycling.org. They have a virtual event coming up on the 11th of February. Uh, where these exact discussions take place uh, and they're sharing best practice around maintenance from cities like Montreal and Helsinki. Um, and uh, so I would certainly encourage you to get involved. 
with that, um, if we don't have any more questions, I, I think I'll uh, wrap this up. It's been a really robust uh, conversation and, and thank you very much for sticking in till the bitter end. Um, I just wanna plug very quickly one more thing uh, and that is um, the, the Crow manual for um, bicycle design, uh, which we are currently um, offering as a, uh, a promotion for the month of December uh, for 99 euros. So if you go to, uh, this is a, a lot of these uh, design details, engineering details that we've been discussing, everything from network design all the way down to curb cut design um, is in this, this Bible of, of bicycle uh, design. And uh, we currently have it on, on offer for 99 euros versus the regular price of 137. Um, if you go to uh, well bitly dot l uh, bitly slash crow holiday or crow platform uh, dot com. So with that, I'm going to hand the floor back to Cornell uh, for some closing words. And I would just uh, again thank you for your involvement. Thank you you to the Consulate General in Toronto for their sponsorship of this event. Thank you to the Bicycle Mayor RC for uh, connecting us with with the region of Waterloo and, and getting this conversation started. I hope it's the first of uh, several conversations that we have moving into the new year and, and would certainly love to hear from you about topics or, or ideas or, or discussions you would love to have uh, in, in your day-to-day -day work. Uh, but for now, I'll hand it to Cornell uh, to say the final words. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the presenters to, and to the uh, Dutch or the Netherlands uh, Embassy for supporting or the Consul for supporting this. And uh, now that you mentioned the Crown Manual, now I see that what will be our contribution to the next edition, and that will be winter maintenance. Because uh, obviously, I mean, that is something that we will have to develop in Canada here. <laughs> I mean, uh, we, we got some, some clues from other places, but I mean, this is a very special issue for, for, for us here. So in a couple of years, uh, I, I, I believe that we will have a whole chapter on that. And I mean, we can include it in your your crow manual uh, otherwise thanks uh, for for the questions and um, well i mean these things are are new things and i mean the, the cycling facility development in our environment and uh, i think the best way and probably the only way to develop those is to rely on local experience and uh, and on experience from others who have done similar things in, in similar environments. So with that, uh, thank you. And uh, those who haven't had lunch, this is the time to go out from your office and have something. Goodbye. <laughs>